Pam Longobardi, I'm thrilled to be talking to you and sharing your largest collection of retrieved ocean plastic. I'm so curious. Tell us all about that. Well, I'm sitting here with a few of my prize uh, drifter project uh, collection, and it's an archive really uh, that began in 2006 when I stumbled upon the enormous amounts of plastic that the ocean was vomiting out in very remote part of uh, the big island of Hawaii. And it really just changed my life. I started actively collecting this, um, going back to that same site over and over again, and then starting to realize this is happening all over the world. So you discovered this ocean plastic. Were you involved with anything having to do with the ocean? Were you studying the environment? Were you a passionate environmentalist or naturalist? Like, what was your relationship? Well, my dad was an ocean lifeguard, so we grew up constantly at the beach in the ocean. And um, he then later became uh, a biochemist for Union Carbide. And it was the early development of plastics. So he would bring home these experiments that they were doing in the lab and make things uh, in our own kitchen. Um, you know, one day he brought home these two chemicals, mixed them together, and it blew up into uh, expansion foam. You know, a lot like the piece that I have right here, which I found in the ocean. And so have a lot of other creatures which have made it their home. So this uh, great stuff uh, was only invented, you know, when I was a child. That's, uh, you know, within um, the last few decades. And yet it's now in the ocean to the extent that plastic is inside of uh, turtles. It's becoming the home for nesting and colonizing uh, mollusks. It's uh, in our human food chains. It's all over and it's toxic. What linked your beginning discovery of plastics with your academic work? I've always just been curious about the natural world. And when I stumbled upon that giant massive piles of plastic uh, coming out of the ocean at South Point, I started to wonder like, where is this coming from? And all of the individual pieces were uh, changed in some way. They've been on a journey, they've been uh, you know, at some point in our hands, and then they have left our hands and traveled through an entire environment of the globe, uh, channeled by the water vectors. And then they've impacted and encountered many, many creatures along the way. So um, we've got plastic that's uh, entered the food chain by being bitten by um, aquatic creatures. This is a flip-flop that I found in Costa Rica, right next to where an enormous 12-foot crocodile was um, lounging. And this was actually the pattern of his teeth. He was huge and he'd been eating this particular flip-flop. So I started to really realize that this is uh, something that we have made, we've kind of unleashed on the world. Um, and we don't know what we're doing with it. We really don't understand uh, how nature is dealing with it, except coming back for me to the objects themselves, I noticed that they become changed by this journey. And to me, they're actually coming back uh, as a message from the ocean. They're, they're, they're literally, I think the ocean's speaking to us through the material of our own making, this plastic as far as the ocean. Do you believe that the ocean is communicating back to us? Absolutely. So I approach it as a scientist and an artist. And, uh, you know, I, I call it a forensic aesthetic approach because what I'm doing is I'm, I'm studying the material. I'm trying to learn from it. I'm trying to understand what it is that the ocean is telling us through this material. Sometimes it's simply noticing um, who's living on it, who's been growing on it. Sometimes it's noticing who's bitten it. Um, other times it's noticing the manufacturer. Other times it's noticing what is it laying next to? How did I uh, start thinking about these things as messages? It was 
literally a single uh, day on that beach in South Point. It was the first day that I started cleaning it. And I found these two objects near each other. And I was sort of stunned. I grew up with my brother playing with these plastic army men, uh, you know, these sort of uh, child uh, propaganda for the normalization of war. And I was, uh, uh, I noticed the one that I found was um, from the vintage that my brother played with. And it was, it was very near on the same beach, this camel. I found these during the height of the Iraq war, the first Iraq war, a war about oil. So I instantly felt like there's something to be gained in terms of knowledge uh, from this material. And this really came to me as a poetic symbol, as a message that here we are taking this last drops of oil that we're so desperately going in places that we don't know how to uh, really contain what we're taking we're running out of that oil. At the same time, we're locking it up in these plastic objects. And the symbolism of um, an army man and a camel in the middle of a war in the Middle East was, was just beyond my comprehension. And this was a war over oil. That, so that was what created the impetus for you to start the Drifters Project? I essentially uh, thought of the, about this as a kind of triangulation between art, science, and activism. Because artists see things, I think, through the emotions and through um, the visual side of the brain. And scientists study data and the alphanumeric quantities and qualities of, of uh, materials. And the activists work from the heart. So I, I feel like this activation of both sides of the brain through the heart of the activist was the driving force behind this project. The materials themselves uh, I also believe in, in some future form will become um, the archaeology museum of our time right now. And so I started this archive with that in mind. And it's now 15 years in the making. Um, it's not only collected by me. I think anyone can do this forensic beach cleaning. Your wish for how people um, begin to engage not just in like a forensic recovery, but just in their approach or association with plastic. What's your wish towards that? I wish that um, when people um, are presented with plastic that they really do think about where all these things go eventually and maybe decide that we don't really need to use it. We don't need it. There's all kinds of other things that can be replacements, glass, metal, wood, bamboo, grasses. And, you know, with that in mind, um, the fact that there are some times you can't avoid plastics, but it's the single use disposable plastic that is the most problematic. And so with that in mind, go to your favorite place, go to your beach, go to your home shore, go to your city streets. You can provide an intervention with any piece of plastic you see. You can interrupt its journey into the mouths and stomachs of the creatures of the ocean and eventually into our own food cycle um, simply by removing that. And along the way, look for those messages look for what oddities you can find. I mean, there's so many strange things that uh, the ocean is sending back to us to talk to us about, you know, a warning. Um, this bird, I think, is a message in a way, almost like um, the Hitchcock movie or something, you know, it's, it's this black bird, it's now been completely encrusted by bryozoa. Um, and yet it's also, um, you know, something that, is telling us to pay attention. You know, I think if we could understand what uh, a bird was saying, it would probably warn us too. Yes, yeah, so this is a call to become an ocean gleaner. Glean that material, learn from it, take it, find its message, and then you can send it to me at Ocean Gleaners on Instagram, hashtag Ocean Gleaners, and OceanGleaners.net. And those materials will be assembled into this large archive, a global archive. What are the messages the ocean is telling you in Indonesia? 
in Costa Rica, in California, in Alaska, in New Zealand. I want to know. I have many, many, many stories to tell here. And I think the thing is that the ocean is bringing these stories to everyone. And I think it's time that we need to pay attention to what she's saying. The Drifters Project archive needs to grow and it needs to grow from the messages and the pieces of plastic that you find. So go to your home beach, go to your neighborhood uh, uh, stream, go to the city street you might live on, go to your um, favorite location where water flows and find the plastic that you can intercept and, and find the message that's there for you. The ocean is speaking to us through this material. And I want to hear what it has to say, and I want to hear what you have to say. Just outstanding. So outstanding, inspiring, and um, just problematic, but with a uh, with light, with a light towards the tunnel that we're all going towards together. So thank you so much for sharing this, and so look forward to more to more dialogue and to discovering what plastic that I retrieve um, speaks to me and, and that, it, that it holds for me. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, TEDx Green Street. <laughs>